Darwin's first postulate is that individuals vary. And we saw in class through the exercises that we did that this component is extremely important for making natural selection work. Darwin, of course, recognized that offspring tend to resemble their parents but do not exactly resemble them. And so he observed that there was variation among populations, but at the time, the reason for that variation, the mechanisms behind that variation, were not well understood. And this is the problem that really kept Darwin awake at night. And the prevailing idea at that time, we've seen this slide before, was this idea of blending inheritance, that offspring were somehow some kind of average between the characteristics of their two parents. And we saw that this idea about the way inheritance works was problematic for the mechanism of natural selection because of this dilution effect. Every time a trait is averaged with another trait, it is only half strength. So this was a big problem for, for natural selection as a mechanism. But if we look at traits such as height and other continuously varying traits, we can kind of see why that explanation for inheritance might have made sense. We now know that these characters that seem to support blending inheritance, where offspring kind of seem to be an average of their two parents, uh, we now know that although inheritance is discrete, gene expression can be extremely complicated, and there can be lots of different factors involved in the expression of these traits. A single trait can be influenced by multiple genes. Um, that's usually the case in these continuously varying traits such as body height. Environment can have a huge influence. Things like nutritional status is going to have an impact on how tall you grow. And there can also be gene by environment interactions and we'll see more about that as we get into the section of heritability in the course. So of course, much of this confusion was settled by the rediscovery of Gregor Mendel's work early in the 20th century, and both of Mendel's laws of inheritance really helped us to understand better how all of this works. So with the law of segregation, we now know that these traits are inherited intact. There's no blending or dilution of traits. A trait that disappears in one generation can reappear full strength in the next one. And that information is not lost through, through blending or mixing. The law that gives us the first clue to understanding why individuals vary, why offspring resemble their parents but not exactly, is this law of independent assortment. So each trait is inherited independently from other traits. And so if we look at this at the chromosome level, what independent assortment means is that during this process of meiosis, homologous chromosomes are separated and then duplicated, as we see here. And then in the two stages of meiosis, meiosis one, there's the two the homologous pairs are separated into separate cells, and then the individual chromatids are then separated into four gametes uh, after meiosis II. So that means that these copies of the chromosomes that were inherited from the father and the ones that were inherited from the mother can recombine into any combination. So here, with just these two chromosomes, we've got blue with blue, or we can have blue with yellow, or we can have yellow with red or we can have blue with red. And so this allows the different characteristics of the two parents to be scrambled in a new way in each individual gamete and therefore in each individual offspring. So this gives us novel combinations of alleles. In addition, during meiosis, another kind of shuffling of the deck can happen in a phenomenon known as crossing over or recombination. So recombination happens in the early stages of meiosis where the two homologous chromosomes line up and they can get very close to each other and actually fuse at some point and exchange the ends of the chromosomes. So here you see the blue one is crossing over the red one and they can actually switch those ends. So now down here you see the chromosome that's mostly red has this segment from the blue chromosome this one that's mostly blue has this segment from the red one. And so when we separate these finally into gametes, we've got one that's identical 
from the one that came from the father, one that is a mix of the two chromosomes um, with a little bit of the blue segment, another one that's mostly blue with a little bit of the red segment, and then another one that is identical to that uh, paternal chromosome. And we see the exact same thing here replicated for uh, this other gamete. So again, we've got the green and yellow crossing over. This can happen anywhere on the chromosome. It can exchange a lot of material or just a little bit. Here we've got just a little bit of this yellow chromosome recombining with the green one and a little bit of the green recombining with the yellow to get two that are identical to the original chromosomes and two that are altered with different genetic material. And so this affects something known as linkage. So linkage is the tendency for alleles of different genes that are located on the same chromosome to be inherited together as a unit because they are because they are on the same chromosome and that chromosome is passed on into the gametes intact. And so when you have crossing over an allele located here on this red chromosome, without the crossing over, it was linked to the allele at a separate gene nearby on the chromosome. And if that crossing over had not taken place, those two alleles of those two separate genes would have always been inherited together as a unit. But then the crossover broke them up and split them onto different chromosomes. And so now you've got a different combination of alleles on the same chromosome. So this is another way of sort of shuffling the deck and having different combinations of traits than what you found in the parents. So both recombination and independent assortment are ways of getting different combinations of traits. What about the emergence of entirely new traits? New traits are created by one thing and one thing only, and that is mutations. Okay, so we're going to call mutations the source of everything new under the sun. Everything else is just reshuffling of the deck. This is where you get new cards in the deck. So what are mutations? A mutation is any change to the genomic sequence. And so now that we have more information about the structure of DNA, and we know something about the genetic code, we can now go a little bit beyond what Mendel knew and, and investigate how these mistakes can be made in the DNA sequence. So we know that the very structure of DNA with these four nucleotides that, that bind to each other in a very specific way ensures pretty reliable replication of the gene sequence. It's not going to be very prone to errors, but errors do happen, and most of the time, they are corrected immediately. There's an army of enzymes whose job it is to proofread and check um, these DNA sequences as they're being replicated to make sure that these errors are not left in place. But this is not a foolproof system. Some of these errors do make it through and get replicated, and these are called mutations. So the simplest kind of mutation is a point mutation, and that's simply when a single nucleotide is changed to another nucleotide. So in this case, a change of G to C. And this is a change in the, in the molecule itself. And so these point mutations can come in different varieties. Remember that we have purines, A and G, that can change from one to the other, and that's a transition. So when a purine changes to a purine, or a pyrimidine changes to a pyrimidine, those are both known as transitions. Or purines and pyrimidines can change into each other in these four different ways, and that's called a transversion. And again, this is a change in the actual molecular structure of these nucleotides. So when this happens, it can have a number of different results. The first possible result is nothing, and this is known as a silent mutation. Certain changes in nucleotide sequence will lead to the formation of the exact same amino acid in translation, and so the protein would not be changed at all. So why is that? This is because of what we call redundancy in the genetic code. What this chart shows is actually the genetic code. So you'll recall that um, nucleotides come in these groups of three called codons, and each codon codes for a specific amino acid. And the way we read this chart is these rows in the grid refer to the first base in the codon, the columns refer to the second base, and each of these rows within a box refers to the third base. 
So in the example that we just saw, where we had a codon that was A, A, G, turned into a codon that was A, 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 both A, A, G here, so there's the G, code for lysine. A, A, A also codes for lysine. So that change in the nucleotide sequence does not affect the amino acid that's coded for. It's not going to change anything. And you'll notice that there is a lot of duplication of the same amino acid for different codons. So, um, for example, leucine is coded by UUA, UUG, CUA, CUC, CUA, and CUG. So there are six different codons that code for leucine. The other thing to notice here is that a lot of this replication is within the same box. So this box has all leucine, this one has all proline, and then you see this in several places. So what that means is that these point mutations are most likely to be silent if it affects the third base in the codon. So for example, with G and C in the first position, no matter what's in that third position, you're going to get alanine. So this is redundancy in the genetic code. Multiple codons specify the same amino acid. So what that means is if you get this silent mutation, you've got no problem. It's coding for the exact same protein, although you can detect this as a different allele using molecular methods, there's not going to be any sort of difference in the phenotype. Second, you can get what are called nonsense mutations. What that means is that one of the codons in the sequence is changed so that it produces a stop codon. So a stop codon tells the translation process to stop there, that's the end of the protein, and so this happens prematurely in cases of nonsense mutations. So what you get is an incomplete protein. It stops before it's finished, and it's likely to result in either a complete loss of function or at least a change in the function of that protein that's produced. Finally, you can have a category of mutations called missense mutations. And so what missense mutations mean is that there is a change in the protein that's coded for um, by that point mutation. And missense mutations can come in two varieties. One is conservative. So conservative means that there are groups of amino acids that have similar chemical properties, so similar binding affinities. So in this case, this purple color indicates an amino acid that's basically um, basic. And this has been substituted one basic amino acid for another basic. It's going to behave fairly similarly in the protein. And so it's likely to have um, fold into similar conformation because it'll have the same affinities for other, for other molecules. It'll be not exactly the identical protein, but the chances are that it's probably going to work fine because it's similar enough to the original amino acid that it probably won't affect the protein that much. The other kind of missense mutation is non-conservative. And so this is when an amino acid with very different chemical properties is substituted. And so in this case, we've got a polar amino acid substituted for a basic one. And this is going to change something about the way the protein functions. It might cause it to fold its tertiary structure into the wrong conformation, so really, really change the binding properties of the pro final protein product. But it's going to result in basically the wrong protein that does not do its job. Probably is not going to work, or it'll work very, very differently from the original protein. It's not going to do the job that the original protein did.